Hello and uh, welcome to the course on Scalable Data Science. Uh, my name is Anirban, I am from IIT Gandhinagar. And today we'll study leverage score and its applications. So, until now, we have looked at different applications of the random projection techniques on various linear algebraic problems, right? And some of these problems, some examples of the things that we have studied have been, number one, application of random projection to approximate PCA, to approximate matrix multiplication. Uh, we have looked at a particular decomposition, low rank decomposition called the QB decomposition. We have also looked at how to apply random projection in order to do L2 regression efficiently. Okay? So the pros of these, uh, of these techniques have been that, uh, that a lot of them are numerically stable and hence practical. They're also computationally efficient, uh, theoretically as well as practically. Uh, but the cons is that, uh, is that when you're computing random projection, right, the result might not always be very interpretable. Right? For instance, imagine that we started with, a, uh, with the matrix of, uh, of documents versus words, right? And, uh, and, and then we, we sort of uh, took a projection of it, some random projection of it on the column space, and, and we have some documents versus projected directions, right? Now these projected directions are uh, linear combinations of words, right? including both positive and negative weights because the random number is going to have, um, I mean, the random variable is going to take both po positive and negative values and therefore we are going to combine words, the word counts, by using coefficients that are both positive and negative. And this does not have any direct interpretable uh, I mean, uh, meaning, right? Because uh, what, does, what does it really mean to take combinations of words? That's point number one. Point number two is that, uh, I mean, See, see, each of the documents itself was fairly sparse, right? But once we take linear combinations of the documents, I mean, it's possible that each document had 10 words on an average. But once we take linear combinations, because the linear combinations are, are dense, are den a, is essentially a dense random projection, the, the matrix that we have at the end is fairly dense, right? And, and this is the same issue that we had seen in the case of the, uh, of the dense random projection. Right. And so it's possible that the space taken by, the, by, this, by this dense projection, although it's low dimensional, is actually much more than the space taken by the original sparse word document matrix. Right. And, the, and there's, there's nothing special about word documents. This could happen for any sparse data. That once you convert that, uh, that once you use random projection, right, or once, you, or, or, or once we get a singular value decomposition of it, Right? The space taken, even, even if we do a low rank decomposition of it, the space taken could be much more than the space needed to represent the original data because uh, either the random projection or the low rank decomposition, for instance, the QB or the SVD, they're all dense. I mean, they're essentially dense. There's no sparsity constraint on them. Uh, so let's keep these two issues in mind as we, as we go through this lecture. So in order to handle uh, these two issues, uh, let us look at, uh, let us think a little bit about the, uh, the relation between projection and sampling, right? So until now, we've really been talking about projections of, of vectors, right? Uh, so what is projection? Projection is essentially nothing but a linear combination. So, so what if, what if we, we wanted to choose actual data points instead of taking linear combinations of data points? Okay, can we, can we do that? Right, and uh, we again had faced this issue when we were trying to speed up random projections, and then we, we resorted to something like a sampling matrix, and then we saw that we could not always do this. Right, we could not always do this while retaining the properties of the random projection. Right? So, so here again, uh, we'll come back to to that question in a slightly different setting, but related setting. And and this actually is is part of a very broad, I mean, a much broader question in uh, in algorithms. Right? Uh, and the broader question being is that given an optimization problem, right, can we create a smaller data set? And we, want, and we are solving the optimization problem over, over a data set X. Right? That suppose we have, uh, we, are, uh, we have a problem, we have, uh, we have some function F and we want to get, let's say, the max of summation F i, right? where the max over F and the summation is over all X i belongs to X. 
right? And my, my intent is to get the f that maximizes this quantity. So the question is that instead of instead of taking the sum, if the if the data set X is very large, instead of taking the sum over all points in the data set, that can I find a much smaller data set? Let me call that C, right? Such that I take the sum over that smaller data set, and maybe I sort of uh, I sort of add in a weight to I sort of multiply each of these by a weight, right? Because because maybe uh, I mean uh, for full generality, let us just uh, I mean put in a weight uh, for each point and instead of taking the sum over the entire data set can I just do the sum compute the sum over the set C so this is typically known as a core set and there's a lot of literature on this from the computational geometry perspective right? but the techniques are mostly orthogonal to the ones that we study have studied in this randomized uh, numerical linear algebra techniques but in a bunch of recent papers, uh, these these directions are starting to converge. So we won't look at the the problem of course sets from the. Uh, so we will look at the problem of course sets again from this rand, uh, from this randomized numerical linear algebra setting, and specifically we'll look at two settings: uh, linear regression and matrix factorization. Okay, and we'll look at a one specific way of, of of creating these course sets by using a sampling technique known as leverage course sampling. Okay. So let us uh, sort of uh, recall what linear regression, the setting of linear regression that we had. That we have, uh, we are we are mostly talking about over constraint setting. That is, n is bigger than d. So we have a set n. Uh, we have a matrix A of uh, that's of size n by d, and we are looking to find a vector x, right? Such that the error minimize for all possible x. A x minus b, two norm. Okay, this is what we're looking to minimize. So at this point, we're not putting any constraint or any regularization of uh, on x. Right, all that, uh, all that is, uh, all that has been done, but we are not covering that in this course. And uh, uh, what were we doing in order to, uh, in order to solve this problem uh, uh, more efficiently? We had a projection matrix omega, right? And we were sort of we were shortening the matrix A. Co converting it into a smaller matrix by multiply, pre-multiplying it with omega and then we also find out a smaller version of B by pre-multiplying it with omega and then we solve the smaller problem. This is what we were doing. Right? So now the question is that, that uh, instead of projection, can I replace omega by a sampling matrix? Right? So what does replacing omega by a sampling matrix mean? What it means is that the, the effect, the omega A right should really be a matrix where each row in omega a right really comes from one of the rows in a and this should happen for all the rows each row in omega a should, should really come from one of the rows from a right and typically we we tend to do sampling uh, with replacement because that's much easier to analyze uh, but there's nothing sacrosanct about it and same and that's the same and, and, and that's the same for each 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 element in b Okay. So, and why would this be helpful? Okay. One of the reasons is obviously clear, huh? that if each row in A is really just a scaled version, so this potentially is scaling, if each row in A is really just a scaled, if each row in omega A is really just a scaled version of, the, of one of the rows in A, then the size taken to store omega A cannot be much more than the size taken to store A. Right? So, the question is that, that does such an omega really exist? Because remember what the what the property that we uh, what was the property that we needed out of omega, we needed the fact that the rank of omega a, right? We need uh, we needed the fact that the rank of omega a is is really equal to the rank of a. Right? In fact, we needed a little bit stronger than this. What we needed was that uh, it, uh, omega preserves the omega preserves the the singular value structure of u of a, right? Which is the which is the left singular vector of which are the left singular vectors of a. Okay, but but let us even forget that. Let us even look at the smaller constraint that we want rank of omega, omega a to equal the rank of a, and then it is not entirely clear, right? That we can actually find such an omega. So of course here is an easy solution, right? That if we were allowed to look at a. And if we were allowed to sort of find out uh,
uh, delinear, linearly independent rows of A, right? Then we might be able to do this fairly easily. But doing that is really akin to just solving this problem, uh, this regression problem, by itself, right? So the question is that can I quickly find out an omega in a in a in a in a, in a, comp in, in a manner that is computationally much much less efficient, uh, that is computationally much more efficient than actually solving the regression problem? And can I still guarantee this? Okay. So the next question, uh, and one that we just mentioned before, is that of finding a CX decomposition. So what is a CX decomposition? Here we are saying that suppose we have uh, users versus movies. Okay, and uh, well, well, what I really want is a low rank decomposition of this matrix because we believe that a low rank decomposition will expose the different genres or the topics that the users and the move uh, and the movies uh, that the users are interested in and that the movies belong to, right? So, uh, so the low rank decomposition is going to put users and movies in the same in the same plane, right? And then and then we can use this representation, this joint representation, in order to do recommendation and so on and so forth. Okay. So, but and now here, interestingly, what we want is that we want this low rank decomposition in a manner that the, I mean, a, a, instead of instead of a general QB decomposition, we want it to be a form such that uh, we first get to choose a set of columns C that are, e, I mean, each of the columns needs to belong to one of the, um, each of the each of the columns of C has to come from one of the columns of A, modulo some scaling. Right? So C is really a subset of the columns of A and I still want to guarantee right, that I can find such a C and such an X and the corresponding X such that the error A minus C X Frobenius is within a small bound, a small factor bound of A minus A K Frobenius which is the optimal error. Okay. And this approximation really, I mean that, uh, I mean, theoretically it should be within some small 1 plus minus epsilon. And of course, epsilon is going to control the size of the size of C. Okay. So, does such a C really exist? Even that is not entirely clear. However, if we could do this, then uh, we have convinced ourselves that this will be useful in a lot of machine learning applications. Right? Because now, uh, now the columns of C are really interpretable. In addition to not being, in addition to having a smaller foot than that of A, the columns of C are also interpretable because they're actually, in this case, for instance, they're actually examples of movies themselves. Okay. So, here is one possible way, right? So we have, remember, we have we have looked at the problem of of matrix multiplication that we have that we are trying to, mul um, I mean, uh, in order to multiply A times B. Uh, uh, two matrices A times B, we created two samples, a sample A from, uh, a sample C from A and a sample R from B using some sort of a length square sampling, right. In particular, one of the, one of the special cases that we looked at is as follows, when, when B equal to A transpose, right. In the case, in the case that B equal to A transpose, then the, uh, then the length square sampling that we were interested in looked, uh, uh, turned out to be the following. Right, that I, I choose C, that I create the matrix C. So the matrix R in uh, if B equal to A transpose, then the matrix R is a, uh, is again equal to C transpose. Right. So I need I need to create only the matrix C, and one of the ways we discussed in order to create the matrix C was to choose the ith column of A with probability that is proportional to the length square of the ith column. Okay. Right. So basically, every 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 column of C, right, is a IID random variable, right, and that IID random variable takes the value of the of the ith column of A with probability proportional uh, with probability PI. Okay. Uh, so it's a it's a it's a multi, it's a uh, and it takes a, 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 a for instance it takes value A one. It, uh, it takes value A one with probability A star one with probability P one. It takes value A star two with probability P two and so on and so forth. Okay. And we are, uh, what we have discussed was that in order, I mean, that once we choose these values of pi, we get this particular approximation, right? That that if the that if I happen to choose c columns, right, I am sort of overloading the uh, uh, the notation c. I'm using it both as a set and as a and as a matrix. But if I if I happen to choose c columns in small c columns in c, then I get the guarantee that a transpose minus c c transpose Frobenius is not very big, in the sense that it is Frobenius sum of a square by square root c. Okay, 
And uh, this particular sampling itself and this particular decomposition itself can then be used to obtain low rank approximation and CX decompositions with additive error, with additive error. Right? And the additive error that we get is really the one that comes out here. And in each of these cases, basically the idea is that, that you choose a set of columns C using, using this particular sampling technique, right? And then you do a low rank decomposition of, of, of that set of columns, right? Or you get a CX decomposition using that set of columns. And, 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 and the bound on the error that you will get in the, the additive bound on the error that you get in these two cases is, uh, comes really from the bound that we have calculated here. And we're not going to go into the details of this. Okay. Because uh, what we are interested in is uh, today is known as the leverage scores. So let me define the leverage scores first. Okay. So let's take a matrix A. Let's consider the setting when n is bigger than d, right? that the number of rows is bigger than the number of columns. And let's take an orthonormal decomposition of the set of, uh, 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 of, the set of columns. Right? So let u be an orthogonal basis of the set of columns and let me write A as u times x. Right? So u is of size n by d. Without loss of generality, assume that A has rank D. So in that case, I define the I, I define the ith leverage score, uh, the leverage score of the of the ith row, right, to be the the row norm, the norm of the ith row of U square, right. So I so I take the so, so I take the ith row of of U, okay, and I and I take the L two square norm of that. Right? And in order to make it a probability, I divide it by the sum of these norms, right? which is essentially the Frobenius norm of u. Okay? So, so, this, so this is a, is a quantity between, between 0 and 1, okay? and the sum of these equals 1 exactly. Okay? And, and this is known as the leverage score of the ith row or we will call it the row leverage scores. So, so one of the things that we will do is that what, uh, we will typically, once we have defined this leverage scores, we will typically create a sample of rows using the leverage scores Li with replacement. Okay? So just like we were using uh, uh, the probabilities Pi in the previous, in the previous slide, uh, we, I mean here instead of the probabilities Pi, we will use this leverage score probabilities Li okay? and, and we will create and we will do sampling with replacement with, uh, I mean, by taking these probabilities. Okay, so, so before, before uh, we show its use, let's look at a few of its properties. Okay. See, so one of the things should be fairly obvious, that row leverage scores only make sense if number of rows is equal, is greater than the number of columns. Because else, the form of u looks as follows. u looks like, um, I mean, uh, u looks like, a, because if number of, if, then, if, if a, a looks like this, number of, if, if the number of columns is bigger than the number of rows, right, then, then u is a square matrix. Right? E, e is a d by d orthonormal matrix. A, a, and in that case, all the row leverage scores, all the row norms of u are all 1. Right? So in that case, it doesn't even make sense to talk about it. And it sort of is intuitive because, because if the number of uh, columns is bigger, then you should not really be talking about sampling rows. You should really be talking about sampling columns. Okay? So, and also an important quantity and an important uh, thing to realize is that while we define the leverage scores in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, a specific orthonormal, I mean an arbitrary orthonormal basis, the actual definition is independent of the orthonormal basis that you choose. Right? Uh, in order to see this, let us just look at this calculation that suppose Q and U are two different orthonormal basis of the, of the columns of, uh, of the columns of A. Okay? And because there are two different orthogonal bases of the columns of A, then there exists some rotation matrix R, right? which is, I mean, rotation, which means an orthonormal matrix, a d by d orthonormal matrix R, such that Q equal to U times R. Right? Uh, what that means is that the, the ith row of Q is really equal to the ith row of U times R. It means that the norm of the, of the, the two norm of the ith row of Q equals the two norm of the ith row of U. Right? And this is true for any two basis, any two orthogonal basis Q and U. And therefore, and because this is what we define as the leverage score, uh, as the, and this divided by the normalization. And, uh, and remember that the normalization, the Frobenius norm of U is always D. The Frobenius norm square of, uh, is always D and that is independent of the basis that you choose. Okay, because both the uh, uh, numerator and the denominator are, are, are independent of the basis that you choose and leverage score itself is independent of the basis. 
So, so here is the, I mean, once you define the leverage course, uh, here is going to be my algorithm for, for linear regression. What we will do is that we will create the matrix, uh, we will create the matrix omega as follows. So, mass omega is going to be a S by n matrix, right? And in order to create the in order to create the uh, the th row, uh, we will choose we will choose i with probability l i with replacement. So therefore, so so and and, and suppose for the th row, uh, we we happen to choose the we happen to choose the i specific i. Right. So therefore, for uh, for the for the tth row of omega, we'll place zero everywhere else except for the except for the tth position, and in that position, we will place uh, we will place one over c square root of li. Okay. Basically, we're normalizing by the by the by the square root of the probability that we chose it with. Okay, and then we solve this. Uh, the, uh, and once we have defined this this particular omega, we use it as we were using it before. Basically, we solve omega a x minus omega b. Okay, and then we return the result as my approximation. In order to do the c x decomposition, here is what we will do. Right? We will first uh, we'll first decompose a as u sigma v transpose u sigma v transpose right and then we will take the top rank a u and v so so it will be a thin svd okay and now what we will do we will define li's because we because now we want to sample columns of a we will look at v transpose instead of instead of u okay and and we will uh, and we will take the row squared length of vk or the or the column squared length of the of the VK transpose, and that and that will give me the uh, the corresponding leverage scores, right? And we will do exactly the same. That will pick column I with probability uh, in order to define C. Uh, we'll pick column I with probability Li, normalize it by by one over square root of Li, and add it to the to the tth column of as the tth column of C. And this will keep on doing with replacement, which means that the same column of A can be picked multiple times and be put in C. And then we will define x to be the, the, the pseudo inverse of c times a, and that's it. Okay. Uh, and what and what we'll be able to show uh, is that both in the uh, I mean both in the linear regression case that we saw uh, saw before, and in the in the in the cx decomposition case that uh, that we're seeing now, uh, is that we'll get a one plus epsilon approximation. Right. So of course, this I mean the the epsilon that you get, you have to be in order to sh show such a result. The epsilon the, uh, that you get has to figure in the number of samples that you choose. Right. So, so only when the number of samples is right, uh, I mean when the number of samples depends on on some on on this on this epsilon and delta, you'll be able to show that with probability one minus delta, you get a uh, you get a guarantee that a minus c x is is not more than one plus epsilon or times the optimal error, and we'll be able to get a similar guarantee. For linear regression, okay. So just uh, so just to give some intuition as to why leverage scores work. So all proofs that uh, show leverage scores have basically the following form, right? That consider u, which is uh, which is an orthonormal basis of a, right? And therefore, and 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 because of that, u transpose u is actually the d by d identity matrix. Okay, it's not very hard to see. And these are the leverage scores, right? Uh, and these are the leverage scores that come out. So uh, so using this leverage scores, we uh, uh, we go from u to u tilde. Right. So, so using the leverage, so sampling using the leverage scores, like I described in the previous two slides, as well as using the normalization, we go from u to u tilde. Right. And uh, suppose we choose, uh, uh, suppose the number of samples uh, that we choose, that is the that is the number of uh, uh, rows of u tilde, is some r, where r is at least uh, d log d by delta by epsilon square. So this epsilon is the error, is my error parameter again, and delta is my confidence. Suppose we have chosen so many rows, so many samples from you. Right? In that case, we'll be able to show that with probability one minus delta, right, the u transpose u. Remember, u transpose u is really the identity matrix T. So u transpose u uh, minus the u tilde transpose u tilde. Uh, the two norm, the spectral norm of this matrix is less than epsilon. Okay. So let me interpret what that means. So what that means, first of all, is that uh, see the I mean the uh, the singular values of of i are all one. Right, and therefore, what this means is that the singular values of, 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 of u tilde transpose u tilde lie between. Uh, in fact, the singular 
values of u tilde transpose u tilde lie between 1, 1 minus epsilon and 1 plus epsilon, which means that the singular values of u lie between square root of 1 minus epsilon and square root of 1 plus epsilon. Okay. It's specifically, what it means is that u tilde is full rank because all the singular values lie in this, uh, lie in this interval, right? And what this will allow uh, uh, us to do later is, uh, in the proofs, is that it, allow, it allows us to bound the norm, the pseudo, the norm of the pseudo inverse of a, right? And this, and this pushes, helps us push the proof through. Okay. So, so how do we estimate leverage scores? Right? Because, because if you were sort of paying attention, in order to, cal I mean, sample using the leverage scores, we, uh, in every case, we needed to get the, uh, we needed, actually needed to get the singular value decomposition, right? And as we saw, that singular value decomposition is fairly, is fairly expensive. In fact, it's at least as expensive as, as the linear, as doing, solving the linear regression and also, I mean, getting a CX pro. So the CX approximation is not so obvious because uh, it's not, it's not clear that such a, without the, Without the proof, without the without without our proof using the singular, using the without our proof using the uh, leverage scores, it was not even clear that the CX decomposition existed, right? With the with a with a small k. So therefore, for the CX decomposition, we can still say that leverage score has its use, but for the linear regression, it's not entirely clear. However, luckily, uh, uh, it's easy to estimate leverage scores. Although, I mean, while we cannot get an exact value of it, we can estimate it to some bound. And it turns out that the entire analysis can work if we can approximate to, uh, to some particular bound. And in fact, here's, a, here's an algorithm for approximating it. And uh, 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 so first, it's going to take time, uh, I mean, which is proportional to n, uh, nd by epsilon times log factors instead of, the, instead of the nd square. And it's going to use the randomized Hadamard transformations that we have seen. Right? Basically, here's the idea that we have a. Right. So, so first we transform A using using the using the randomized uh, uh, Hadamard transformation matrix, right? And then we get a much smaller a much smaller A, right? Okay. So, so we uh, so we get a A which is S by uh, so A is n by d, and uh, using uh, using a using a PhD matrix omega A we get omega which is S by n. So this is omega A, right? And then we do a QR decomposition of this, of this, uh, oh, I'm calling it P out here, and therefore I'll rename it to say that this is P, okay? So, so PA is of size S by N, and then we do a QR decomposition of PA, which is actually cheap now, because, because PA is of size only S by N, right? And then we get, uh, see, the point is that the R that we get out here is a, is a very good approximation of the R in the, uh, that we could have gotten if we had done the QR decomposition of the original A. So therefore, once we look at the matrix A R inverse, right, that is a very good approximation to, that is a very good approximation to an orthogonal basis of A, right? So, so, so A R inverse is a, is a very good approximation to the, uh, to, to the U, which is an orthogonal basis of A. Right? And therefore, by using the uh, matrix A R inverse, in fact, uh, we can do another, uh, I mean, in fact, because we only need the length of the rows of A R inverse, we can, uh, we can do another trick with the random projection just for speed. But basically, by using the matrix A R inverse, we can get a very good approximation of the leverage scores. Huh? So just to summarize that uh, in, this, in this technique, uh, I mean, in this lecture, we, uh, we discuss the role of sampling versus projection. And we discuss that sampling is more preferable to projection if you're interested in preserving things like the sparsity of the matrix, the total memory footprint, the interpretability, as well as it's often useful in downstream machine learning applications. Uh, we did see at least one interesting, uh, I mean, uh, basically two interesting ways. One is the length square sampling and the other is the leverage score sampling in which we are doing length square sampling with respect to the, uh, an orthogonal basis, right? And we saw that uh, this particular leverage score has very interesting uh, implications in, uh, in, solving linear in solving linear regression as well as getting a CX decomposition approximately. There is an extension of leverage scores to other norms. Uh, However, uh, there are, while there are theoretical results, the, uh, I mean, the extension of leverage score to other norms is not really very practical yet, right? Uh, just for the, just to give you some references, uh, a lot of the slides as uh, I have been gotten from uh, Michael Mahoney and Petros' talk from their bootcamp that you can Google, that you can obtain by Googling this, and it's really a very nice set of lectures. Uh, and we have been following these lecture notes by both of them, and thank you. <laughs>